Well, that's what we're going to talk about. Notice on the screen the theme of this morning, doing this series on the Holy Spirit and His work. And this morning, we're going to talk about flesh and spirit in conflict. So if you're following me in your Bible, you want to turn to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 is a chapter that is here to show us how the Holy Spirit is at work in the life of the believer and also how the Spirit is able to produce in our lives what Scripture refers to as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. For example, verse 22 of chapter 5, Paul wrote, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Who couldn't use more of those fruit in our life? Against such things there is no law. Now, I want to come back in a little while to this particular idea of fruit, but I'd like to first of all take you back to the passage we were into last week, and that's Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, or you could translate it, walk by means of the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Uh, walk in the influence and control. Uh, It's the idea of ordering your life around the work and leading of the Spirit. He says, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, Uh, meaning the old sin nature. That's what that term is pointing to. He says this, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Notice, if you would, on one hand, the spirit is at work in our life as believers, and he's trying to bring us under his control. And then, on the other hand, There is what the Bible calls the flesh. And the flesh is also trying to bring us under its control. And so there is this conflict. These are in opposition to one another, says Paul. There is a fight over you, over you between the flesh and the spirit. We're getting a little ringing feedback there, Dan. So, I want to come back in just a moment to the spirit again, and his desire is to, remember, take control over our lives. And by the way, when the spirit is in control, when that is taking place, what happens is the production of spiritual fruit. When the flesh is in control, what happens is what the Bible calls the works of the flesh. By the way, notice the contrast here. Works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit. The reason for the difference, I think, is because works are things that are driven by you. They come from within you. They live in you and find expression in you because of your will and where it's set. On the other hand, fruit is something that grows normally and naturally and automatically when things are healthy. Uh, If you have a healthy garden, for example, I know a little bit about garden work. You wouldn't think that, I know, but I do. Both of my grandparents were farmers, and uh, I know this, when you have a healthy garden, when you tend it and care for it, 
you will get fruit. You will get a good harvest. If you have uh, fruit trees that are a part of your yard or property, if you take care of those trees and if they are healthy, you're going to have an abundance of fruit. Same is true for a believer. If you are a healthy believer, there will be in your life this production of spiritual fruit. On the other hand, you've got an enemy to overcome, and that enemy is called the flesh. Now, I'd like to show you at this point what the Bible says to us about, about flesh. So let me begin here. Uh, the term flesh comes from the Greek word sarx, and sarx has a wide range of meaning, and it's always determined by the context. Uh, you could use it in animal flesh, animal sarx, or human sarx. In the usage of Galatians chapter 5, well, think of it this way, if you would. As a Christian, as a Christian who has been born again of God, I have a new nature, and I also have become a partaker of the divine nature in 2 Peter 1 verse 4, but I still live in this body of sin. It's almost like, and I'm speaking figuratively just to help convey what I'm saying, it's almost like every cell and atom in our body has been infected with this, this virus, this disease called sin. Uh, watch what Paul says in Romans 6.6. 6. He writes, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. And so notice the language here, our body of sin. And so the body of sin with, with all of its activity of resistance to God that is what we refer to as the flesh. Uh, let me read this from John MacArthur. He writes, The redeemed soul must reside in, excuse me, must reside in a body of flesh. That's what I just said. I, I have a redeemed soul, but I still live in this unredeemed body of flesh that is still the beachhead of sin. The body is just a body. The problem is the virus of sin has infected the body. That is still the beachhead of sin, a place that can readily be given an unholy thought and longing. It is that powerful force, sin, within our mortal bodies that tempts and lures us to do evil. When we succumb to the impulses of the fleshly mind, our mortal bodies will again become instruments of sin and unrighteousness. It is a fearful thing to consider that if we allow them to, our fallen and unredeemed bodies are still able to thwart the impulses of our redeemed and eternal souls. And of course, this is why Paul will say in Romans, uh, well, here's the rest of that. The body is still the center of sinful desires, emotional depression, and spiritual doubts. And this is why Paul writes, therefore, do not let sin reign where? In your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, meaning the lusts that is in the body. By the way, consider this too. There's an old gentleman by the name of Harry Ironside at the turn of the century. He was a, really a gifted evangelist, and he wrote this. This is helpful to be reminded of. He says, the flesh is the, the flesh in the oldest and godliest Christian is as incorrigibly evil 
as the flesh in the vilest sinner. All efforts to reform or purify it are in vain. Do do you get what he's saying? The flesh doesn't weaken as you get older. I can bear witness to that. (laughs) And I'm sure a lot of you can as well. The flesh doesn't bear witness or doesn't grow weaker as you grow older. In fact, I want to give you a few thoughts to think about. These are truths that I think come right out of the Scripture and our understanding of the concept of flesh. Number one is this, the flesh cannot be changed from its rebellious, non-submissive nature. It cannot be changed. In fact, what God does with the flesh is condemn it in Christ, Romans 8, 3. What the law could not do, weak or uh, because, weak as it was through the flesh or because of the weakness of the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in sinful, but in the likeness of, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Notice the darkened word sin there. Whenever you read that word in the singular, it's referring to the flesh. It's referring to the sin nature. He condemned sin or he condemned the flesh in his body. That's what it's saying. Now, here's my second thought. The flesh will never be reformed it can never be corrected or restored to purity. In fact, Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, they would use the term heart at times as a synonym for the sin nature or the flesh. Jeremiah says the heart, the sin nature, is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And of course, Only God is capable. Man today tries to understand it. Why do people go off on others and do crazy things? No one can understand it except God. Number three, all this means, number three, the flesh can never be trained to be different. It's beyond all correction. Number four, the flesh cannot be improved by any religious or spiritual effort. See also Martin Luther. If there was one man in history that tried to subdue the flesh through human self-effort, it was Martin Luther. But he came to the end of himself. He couldn't do it, which is why he turned away from Catholicism. It's what drove him away, and he discovered the concept of justification by faith and renewed it in the life of the church. Number five, the flesh cannot ever be reconciled to God. Remember the verse I read. It's at war with God in opposition to. Look at this, Romans 8, 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Look at verse five, jumping back a bit. Those who are dominated by the flesh... Think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that please the Spirit. So, letting your flesh control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the flesh is always hostile to God. Notice, always. It never did obey God's laws And it never, never will. It never will. That's God making a pretty profound statement in my view. This is why you have Paul saying in Romans 7, 24, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Or look at the New Century version of that same statement. What a miserable man I am. Who will save me from this body that brings me 
death. And of course, in the next verse, he will tell us how that can come about. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, back to Galatians 5. I feel a, a real need this morning to take you through three verses that talk about the flesh and all of the activity thereof. I want to read through this, three verses, and then I'm going to come back and take you through it uh, at a slower pace. So let's start with verse 19. Paul says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, back to verse 19. Paul says, The deeds of the flesh are evident, and they are uh, these. And the first word is immorality. I put the Greek term next to it, the word pornea. You hear the word porn in that? Pornographic pornography. Uh, porne, pornea is a word used in the first century that it's a comprehensive term, and it refers to all manner of sexual immorality that is outside the context of a committed married relationship between a man and a woman. All manner of sexual behavior outside of that committed married relationship is called pornea. And of course, as we all know, there are a lot of people in our day who scoff at this. And by the way, they did it in Paul's day and time as well. For example, uh, in those days, there uh, were men who uh, thought of uh, sex as, a, as an itch. And what do you do with an itch? Well, you scratch it. For example, here's a, an, a Greek philosopher orator by the name of Demosthenes. Uh, in one of his speeches, he wrote this. We keep mistresses for pleasure, concubines for daily concubinage, but wives we have in order to produce children legitimately and to have a trustworthy guardian of our domestic property. This is how, right here, is how a lot of men felt back in that time. And look at our world today. Uh, Malcolm Muggeridge said that Western culture is now in the grip of what he calls, listen to the word, erotomania. Very appropriate. Erota, erotic, erotomania. It's, It's... It just permeates the culture in a way that is not pleasing to God. God says, this is a gift that I'm giving you. And it's a gift to bring you, uh, to to bring in your life a great deal deal of fulfillment. You can procreate, but I want you to treat it with dignity and respect. Now, the second word that he gives us is the word impurity. You can see it there. Akakarthsia is the, the, the term in Greek. It means mental and moral uncleanness. Uncleanness. For example, think pornography. That's the idea. You know, it used to be when I was a kid growing up, pornography was something you had to sneak about to get. It was kind of under the table and underground, but not today. It's at your fingertips. 
It's in your home. Let me tell you something. You must get filters on your computer. For the sake of your children, you must get those filters on your computer. And let me tell you why. The effect that pornography has on people is just devastating. Let me share this with you, the findings of a particular study. When male subjects were exposed to as little as six weeks' worth of standard hardcore pornography, they, number one, developed an increased sexual callousness toward women. Number two, they began to trivialize rape as a, as a criminal offense or no longer considered it a crime at all. Number three, they developed distorted perceptions about sexuality. Number four, they developed an appetite for more deviant, bizarre, or violent types of pornography, normal sex no longer satisfied. Number five, they devalued the importance of monogamy, one man, one woman and lacked confidence in marriage as either a viable or lasting institution. And then number five, they viewed non-monogamous, in other words, adulterous, relationships as being normal and natural behavior. Oh yeah, it chisels away at human virtue like probably nothing else in the culture. And the effect that it has on children is profound. Dr. Victor Klein studies the effect of porn on children. Look at this. He writes, during certain critical periods of childhood, a child's brain is being programmed for sexual orientation. During this period, the mind appears to be developing a hard wire for what the person will be aroused by or attracted to. Exposure to healthy sexual norms and attitudes during this critical period can result in the child developing a healthy sexual orientation. In contrast, if there is exposure to pornography during this period, sexual deviance may become imprinted on the child's hard drive and become a permanent part of his or her sexual orientation. This is what Paul is talking about. Don't let it into your home. Get filters on your computer. The temptation is way too strong. Now, the next term that Paul gives us is the word sensuality. The, the Greek word is eselgeia. eselgeia. Uh, the term is defined this way. It's a disposition of the soul that resents all discipline. Who are you to tell me what to do? I've heard that a lot. Who are you? Who are you? It's an attitude that acknowledges no restraints, dares whatsoever its caprice and wanton insolence may suggest. To be totally, uh, here's another definition, esogia means to be totally driven by pleasing the senses without shame. It's, it's like the ancient Epicureans, their philosophy was Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. The bookends of life are birth and death. There isn't anything after that, so indulge and exploit the senses with pleasure, because that's all there is. By the way, if I was not convinced of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, I would be an Epicurean, because the reality is, if there is no resurrection, Paul said it himself. Let us eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. It's all over. But there is a resurrection. And you can't get around it. It's a mountain in the road of every non-believing person. And they simply can't get around it. 
Now, <clears throat> how about this? The next term is idolatry. I do olatria. I do olatria is somehow the way you pronounce it. <laughs> It means, obviously, the worship of any other thing before God, putting something above God. It could be a thing. It could be a political philosophy. I think there are people in our country on the far left, I hate to say this, but they are committed to secularism, and that's their religion. It's their philosophy, their worldview. And it's scary, to, to say the least. Uh, people can be placed over and above God. It happens, doesn't it? Uh, have you ever stopped to listen to the lyrics in our music? How people sing about one another and their, the, the value that that other person has in their life? I, as I was thinking about this the other day, I heard a song that kind of reflected exactly what I'm saying. You ever hear this guy, Barry White? I mean, he's cool. He's got that deep, deep voice. And he, he has this song, My First, My Last, My Everything. You've heard it. I, I was going to play the music, actually, uh, but I thought it moves and everyone would start getting up dancing. <laughs> No, we don't need that, right? It is, a, it is a good song. The music really moves you. But look at this. Here's the lyrics. He says to his lady, you, you are my first, my last, my everything. The answer to all my dreams. You're my sun, my moon, my guiding star. My kind of wonderful, that's what you are. I see so many ways that I can love you till the day I die. You're my reality. Yet I'm lost in a dream. You're the first, the last, my everything. And on and on it goes. These are words that reflect the sheer worship and idolatry of another human being. And I realize it's just a song, but is it? Or is it where a lot of people are at in what they give to another person or another thing that is different than and above the place that God is meant to have in our life? Next comes the word sorcery. And the Greek term, as you can see, is pharmakia. Uh, we get our word pharmacy. A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar, writes about this. He says, pharmakia is the ministering of drugs. Uh, there's always been a lot of poppy uh, weed growing in the world. The ministering of drugs, however, the sorcerers monopolized the word for a while in their magical arts and used it in connection with idolatry. Ancient sorcerers and oracles commonly use mind-altering drugs to induce their visions and healings. And then he says, and this is his quote, drugs are used in association with sorcery because they place the practitioner into an altered state of consciousness whereby he or she becomes more open to contact with the demonic realm. That's what Paul is talking about, uh, sorcery, pharmakia, in this context, very dangerous. The next word is, is enmities, ekthros is the Greek term, and I want you to listen to the definition, ekthros. It speaks of a deep hatred or resentment that drives a person into hostility. For example, we can see this in our culture. Think of how a lot of people in the culture today just despise and hate our president. And as a result of that, more and more you're seeing hostility against people because of him. 
Now, no matter where you're at in the, the political spectrum, that isn't, that isn't right. That's illegal. That's evil. That's behavior that is driven by flesh. The next word is strife, E-R-I-S. You pronounce that eris, eris. This is the idea of bitter rivalry, but it's more than simply being in another camp than a particular person. It's rivalry that is driven by pure ambition or envy. And then jealousy, zealous is the word. I think we all know what that is. We've all experienced jealousy in one way or another and from one degree to another. Uh, Shakespeare referred to it as the green-eyed monster. And it can be a monster when it becomes strong and powerful in our lives. How about the next term, thumas, outburst of anger. By the way, thumas is the strongest Greek word for anger in the Bible, thumas. It, it means rage, explosions. Um, I've tried to illustrate it in the past in this way. Imagine going out to your backyard and you want to burn up some tree limbs, etc. So you get it all in a pile and then you throw gasoline on that and then you flip a match. What happens? Whoosh! It just it kind of explodes. That's thumas. It's explosive anger, explosive rage. And then the next term there is disputes. Disputes. By the way, are you noticing that a lot of these terms of the flesh, they have to do with uh, the idea of damaged relationships? And, and that is something to take note of because remember, in Christianity, we are called out of the world and into the body of Christ. Christianity is a community of faith. We are meant to be with other believers, uh, people who will help us in support, who will help us in the things that are, that are taking place in our life. We need the support of the body of Christ. This is not something you can do on your own. You just can't do it. You need other people to support and help you. And the adversary is always at work attempting to create division, to create bad attitudes toward one another. And we can't allow it to happen. The word disputes there, erythia, means according to Thayer, uh, his Greek lexicon. I want you to listen to the definition of this word. Erythia means a selfish desire to win in a partisan, factious spirit. I'm going to say it again. A selfish desire to win in a partisan, factious spirit. See also the U.S. Senate, right? <laughs> That's a perfect definition of what we saw this week. And then the word dissensions is uh, dicostasia, which means the decided and violent taking of a side on the basis of selfish and unyielding, unyielded grounds. And then factions, high rhesus. It means to segregate, uh, to become a sect. Uh, we might refer to the, these as cliques. And sometimes that's the case. By the way, let me just say something about the, the term cliques. I don't think all cliques are bad. I think there are good cliques and bad cliques. Uh, a, a clique is, let's say, you find certain people uh, admirable and you like to be around them. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as that group does not become exclusive and condescending toward others. Everyone has certain people that they like to hang out with. 
But it doesn't mean that's their life. It just means they like to be with those people. There's nothing wrong with that. You can call that a clique. I wouldn't. But a clique is when you're part of a little group and you have this condescending and exclusive attitude. And that, of course, is driven by the flesh. Now, we're almost done. In verse 21, the next word is envy. Envy. Uh, Here's what's interesting. This particular word means not just wanting what someone else has, but you resent the other person for having it. That's the difference between envy and jealousy. Uh, This word means not just wanting what another person has, but resenting that person because they have it and you don't. That's the idea And that's the difference from jealousy. And then notice metha, which is the Greek word here for drunkenness. Excess of alcohol. I can't tell you how many times over the years someone has pulled me aside, someone that Uh, doesn't follow the Lord, and they have said to me, Pastor, I saw one of your people the other night. Oh, baby, they were drunk. They were loaded. You should have seen them on the dance floor. You should have seen them uh, at the party. What am I going to do with that? My heart sinks when I hear that. It's, it just sinks. I remember a story Dale Moody wrote about. He said he was walking the streets of Chicago, and there was a man who was pretty well looped, and he approached Moody. His speech was very slurred, and he was stumbling about, and he said, Mr. Moody, I'm so happy to talk with you. I want you to know that I'm one of your converts. (laughs) Moody said to him, sir, you must be one of mine. You certainly can't be the Lord's. (laughs) That was appropriate in my view. The next word is carousing. You know what this word means, carousing, komos? It means to live for the party. To live for the party. And I remember that well. I lived the first third of my life in that way, living for the party, living for the weekend. I mean, just can't wait for the weekend so that we can get things moving, you know. Some kind of party time going on. That becomes a way of life for people. It certainly did me. And I'm reminded of what Peter said in 1 Peter 4.3. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people do or enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. He says, look, you've had enough. You've had enough. It's time to come clean and follow the Lord. Now, The last part of verse 21 here, I'm going to read it in a moment. This is a section we can't afford to just brush aside as if it has no uh, pertinence to us. Look at what Paul says, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things. The verb tense is presence, so we're talking now about a life pattern, right? Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I think you can see this text is a warning against the possibility of deception and the worst kind of deception is self-deception. Paul said, I told you once, and I have to tell you again. 
don't fall for this phony thinking. In other words, don't buy into what Paul Tripp refers to as the grand delusion. The grand delusion. What is the grand delusion? I'm, I'm glad you asked. Here it is. The grand delusion of every act of sin is that we can be disloyal to God, live as we please, and everything will work out in the end. That's the delusion. Do you remember Samson? He kept playing around, getting closer and closer and closer. And the Bible says the spirit left him and he didn't even know it. Like a moonbeam across a marble floor, he didn't even know it was taking place. He went on as if he was the same guy. And then when he had to, he started throwing those same punches and he couldn't knock anybody down. And they took him. I think you know the story. Well, let me finish this up. The reason I'm spending all of this time on this concept of flesh this morning, it's based on something that I read earlier in the week from uh, Tony Evans. Something happened there, Josh. Kick it back up. There we go. I want to read this to you. This really spoke to me. He wrote, once you realize the flesh can't be salvaged and it is destined for dust, it will radically change your approach to the Christian life. You will give up trying to tame or fix the flesh and concentrate on building up your inner person by the power of the Spirit. The flesh is the base camp of all enemy operations that come from One, Satan the deceiver, and two, the evil godless world system opposed to and an enemy of God. These enemies gain a foothold in our bodies and especially our minds by means of the flesh. Maybe you remember what Paul the apostle said of himself. Romans 7, 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. Nothing good. He's not talking, he's not saying there's nothing good about me. He's saying there's nothing good that dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. And then he goes on and he tells us why he says it. See if this isn't your experience as well. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. That's called spiritual bipolar. (laughs) Spiritual schizophrenia. (laughs) Verse 20, but if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin. Remember what I told you about sin in singular? It means the flesh, the sin nature. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. And then he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And I would add, the answer Jesus gives us is the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. 
And briefly, here's, here's what I mean. When you receive Christ, understanding the gospel and the cross, when you receive him, he enters into your life. He puts you and I in a position to live outside the flesh, to, to, to have the potential to triumph over the flesh. And the way he does it is this. He forgives us. He takes away the judgment that is against our sin. He does it through the work of Christ, the finished work. And then he pours into our life the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this then becomes our position, our posture for living. Paul puts it this way. So now, remember Romans 7, what I just read to you, all of that schizophrenia? He says the answer is in Christ. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Why? Because my condemnation, which is just, was experienced in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago when he died in my place as my substitute. So, Paul then says... And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin, singular, that leads to death. What it all boils down to is this. As a believer, you now have a choice. If you're a Christian, you have a choice. You see... You have never been given the power to do, to do the Christian life in your own way, on your own terms. You can't do it. You have never been given the power to do, but you do have the power to choose. What you choose determines what you do. If you choose the flesh, the flesh takes over, and you end up Ultimately, you will experience the death, in, in some way, the death that comes with choosing the flesh. If you choose the Spirit, the Spirit takes over, and you will reap the bounty and the beauty and the peace and the joy and the love that the Holy Spirit is going to bring into your life and into mine. It's, it's a choice. It's a choice. Do you realize something? And I close with this thought. I hope you can see that what I'm talking about, there really is no middle ground. You are either in the spirit or in the flesh. You're not partially here and partially there. No, no, no. You're not a little bit spirit and a little bit flesh. You are either in the spirit or you are in the flesh. You say, Bill, how can you tell? That's very simple. What are your thoughts? What do you think about all day long? The mindset on the flesh is set on the things of this world exclusively. The mindset on the spirit thinks thoughts of God, thinks biblically, looks at life through the lens of, of Scripture, of biblical truth, and there is joy and peace in that life. We have to decide how we're going to live our lives. And I would encourage you today to make the decision to choose your life dominated by the power of the Spirit. And if you'll do that, you, you'll, you're going to have some struggle. Oh, yeah. But you will have God's enablement on you, working in you and working through you. And life is going to blossom spiritually. I can assure you. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I, I do thank you I do thank you that we have a way, you have given us a, a, a way to overcome 
the domination of the flesh. Lord, we are no longer slaves to sin because we are children of God. We have been redeemed. We have been given the gift of your Spirit who indwells us. And now, Lord, we choose to be filled with the Spirit. We pray that our lives are going to be animated by the Spirit and that there will be growing in our life that wonderful fruit that the Apostle teaches us about. Let this be a church that is filled with spiritual fruit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. This morning, if you would like to pray, as always, you're welcome to come forward, and we will certainly spend some time in prayer with you.